All right, I think we'll um, I think we'll get started. Nice to see people here, even on the Friday before Memorial Day. So thank you very much for taking some time. Um, so it is a particular delight today to be able to welcome uh, Jeanette Blumberg from um, IBM's Almaden Research Center in in San Jose. So. Um, uh, Jeanette and I go back longer than probably either of us cares to think about very much um, um, to the time we both spent at, uh, at Xerox back in that room. Um, and she is uh, uh, very well known for her work in CSCW and in participatory design. Um, she is one of a, a, you know, a handful of um, pioneering uh, ethnographers working inside corporate contexts work that she's done in a number of different places, um, not all of which I will detail. Um, but now she is um, uh, at, at IBM and doing some work, as most of you will know, IBM has been um, sort of transforming itself over the last few years around um, uh, cognitive computing, large-scale data analytics, and efforts in that space. And what Jeanette's going to tell us about is some of that from the from that sort of organizational social science perspective. So, okay, great. Thank you. thank you, Paul. It's great to uh, great to be here. Um, first time actually at the, the campus. First time in Irvine, and uh, which is a little unusual because uh, I know a lot of people here <laughs> currently, <laughs> and over the years I have known a, a lot of folks. Uh, and as a, a native Californian, I uh, actually remember when the university was being built. So <laughs> uh, it's great to be here and great to have some wonderful weather. Um, so the way I've organized my talk, and hopefully I will make it through, although I, I, uh, I've never given this exact talk before, so I, I hope I'll keep within the time limit. But I have a few places where I'll cut out if I, if I don't. But I thought I would actually spend a couple of minutes up front kind of giving just a little context. I don't want to spend that much time because I want to get into the meat of the talk, but um, uh, saying a little bit about where I am because I think <coughs> it may be a little different than a lot of the speakers who come here from uh, universities around the US <coughs> and the world. Uh, and I come from a, a corporate research environment uh, and a lot of my research over the years, not all at IBM, has been in that context. So. I thought I would say a little bit about IBM research. I'd say just a little bit about sort of the, the places I've been. So good thing Paul did not recite them. <laughs> uh, and then I, I would say also a little bit again, hoping a little bit doesn't mean it's useless, but a little bit about the, the research domain that I've been working in. Because all of the examples that I'm going to use for the main part of the talk are based on um, uh, the part of IBM's business. It's called the IT. Um, uh, infrastructure services business. So I'm going to just say briefly about that. And then I'm going to uh, talk about the, the issue, the problem, the question of how you move from data to smart decisions. We're hearing a lot about, you know, that's the, that, that is, the future is here and it's all about using data to get smarter at the things people do, the things organizations do. <clears throat> and and uh, sort, of, sort of develop, you know, some of the issues around how you move from data to smart decisions. And then I've got three examples um, from research that I have done, and th that research is inside of IBM, looking at IBM as an organization. Um, say a little bit about the limits of uh, organizational analytics, and probably won't get to this part, but I also put a little in about where my research is moving now, and that's it, looking at issues around organizational analytics in relationship to, well, what? Cognitive. <laughs> the cognitive era, artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, and, and so on, and you know, whether the issues that I'm going to explore in the main part of my talk, how they are relevant or, or not for, for uh, the, the kind of questions that are being asked uh, as we think about using analytics to um, augment human intelligence. Um, so, IBM Research, just 3,000 researchers worldwide. Uh, Almaden's about 400 people, there are 12 labs. Increasingly, the, the, the growth of uh, the pop research population has been not in the U.S., but in, in the emerging labs in, in Brazil, and uh, increase in numbers in China and India and so on, but, um, but, but uh, uh, laboratories all over, over the world. And the view is that, you know, both there's, that's where uh, we can get a lot of really talented people, but also the problems 
uh, and questions are, are different in those different geographies. I think that's been particularly important as we've de developed labs in, say, Brazil and in, in Africa, that uh, the question is how is it that we can get closer to the kinds of issues and technology <coughs> opportunities, you know, uh, in these developing parts of the world. Um, the research population uh, comes from many different disciplines. Um, you know, material science, physics, chemistry, uh, engineering, mathematics, um, and there is, uh, this is a slide, uh, these are not my slides, by the way, I, I stole them from a, an overview deck that, that uh, is often given if you want to tell people about IBM research. And there's a bu bubble there called the behavioral sciences, <coughs> and in that bubble is where I guess I find myself, and uh, there, you know, it's largely, has been largely kind of linguistics, psychology, some HCI and human factors, and a sprinkling of social science here and there, myself included, and, and here and there in other labs as well. Um, and, um, you know, and over the years, you know, we've, we've, I think, raised the profile of the social science perspective <coughs> and the kind of research that goes on at IBM Research. Um, then this is Almaden. I just had to show you a beautiful view. That's an aerial view of Almaden. It's, if you ever in the area, come visit us. I think the interesting point to be made here is that uh, it's up on a hill. It's uh, you know like a, almost a mile up in one direction to get up there, and you pass you know cows and turkeys and <laughs> an occasional coyote. And this lab, along with Xerox Park, where um, Paul and I were many years ago. Um, is you know, the idea back then when this lab was being developed was that you took researchers and you kind of isolated them, that they needed the getaway, beautiful environment, think deep thoughts and you know, figure out to invent the future or whatever. And that has changed radically. And so now there's all kinds of attempts to figure out how do you get people off the hill, more engaged with clients, more engaged in the world. So I don't think we'll see very many more of these kinds of facilities <laughs> in the future, I don't know. Um, and then the other photo there is actually inside of Almaden, and that's the long hall, uh, wood paneling, big windows, you know, so again, kind of uh, you're going to, uh, 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 I don't know, escape uh, to a beautiful spot to think deep thoughts. Um, so this is a slide that I'm not going to spend much time on, um, <laughs> but this is just to give you a sense of where I've been over the course of uh, many years now, uh, and including at Xerox PARC, uh, now at IBM, with a, a, a brief stay at a company, Sapient, a business and technology consulting company. But along the way, I think the point of this slide, not only to show a picture of my work group at, at PARC, which uh, is a, some of you may know some of these folks, Julian Orr, uh, Lucy Suchman, Randy Trigg, Kathy Marshall, Brigitte Jordan, they're, they're all in that photo. Um, but, um, but also to say that part of, you know, the journey that I've been on is to also be connected to the academic world uh, in various capacities over the years, including advising students and so on. And that's been an important part of my own development um, and, and, uh, and fortunately some rewarded also um, at IBM Research and also other places that I've been. But I, I, maybe I didn't say that I, by my disciplinary background is as an anthropologist, and that's always been kind of a, and people look at me like, you're crazy, you what? You work in high-tech corporate <coughs> settings and you're an anthropologist, and I try and explain what I do and why that does in fact make sense. But one of the issues is that um, if you come from that discipline, uh, as this, this quote here says, for many anthropologists, <coughs> it feels right to be critical of corporations. And so your own discipline, in a way, is challenging what in the world are you doing inside of a corporation and how can you do research that's um, def defensible. And, you know, and, and it, obviously it's something, it's an ongoing set of questions that you have to be asking yourself. But I, I kind of both uh, take, well, I take uh, some comfort or some, I think about it similarly uh, to the way that Lucy has, has uh, uh, articulated it in this quote, and, and both admitting the challenge, <coughs> but also saying that one of the opportunities is the ability to try and redraw the frame. How do you change the set of questions that are being asked from inside uh, these organizations? And that's what I have. I think if I were to characterize my, 
my career overall, it would be how do I find places where there's an opportunity to redraw the, the frame to have people think differently about uh, what we're up to here. And so it, over the course of my time at IBM, these are the areas that I've worked in. I'm going to spend most of my time, uh, all of my time actually, on the, the second of these major bullets here, the organizational analytics. But I spent uh, time earlier on um, sort of exploring issues around uh, service science and service research, looking at issues of uh, cli uh, provider client interactions and collaboration among distributed uh, uh, across organizational boundaries between clients and, and IBM in the services business. And then another project looking at global work redesign and in particular interested in sort of the limits of standardization in work as you try and standardize work uh, all around the world. IBM obviously is a global company with you know, these data centers delivering these IT outsourcing services from all over the world. And so the idea that you could actually standardize the work uh, no matter where it was located became a really interesting <coughs> question and, and an opportunity, I believe, to redraw the frame. Um, and so now what I'm going to spend my time in the talk talking about is this question of organizational analytics and I'm looking at it through three projects, uh, the, the latter three here, the workflow analytics, uh, productivity analytics, and cloud sales analytics. And then the direction that I'm sort of building off of this prior work is uh, moving into what I'm calling a, an area called cognition and practice, where I'm particularly interested in how, uh, how we think, <coughs> how we can redraw the frame about what cognition is. And of course, lots of people uh, have been doing, trying to do this for a long time, and many uh, approaches and, and uh, perspectives on that. But they're not ones that are um, visible, uh, actively visible inside of IBM, and I think a lot of other technology <coughs> Uh, development organizations that are building these AI type capabilities, but thinking about cognition in a different kind of way as embedded in practices and how the practices of those you're trying to um, imbue with, uh, with uh, augmented intelligence is really critically important to the ability of these technologies to, um, to, to have the impact that everybody would like them to have. Um, so just to Two sentences or so about IT infrastructure services. Again, that's the focus of the research I'm going to be talking about. Uh, this is where IBM, and on the case, IBM or any large company who provides these services, um, manages the IT infrastructure of another <coughs> large company. Um, and um, over the years, this has changed somewhat. It used to be when I first arrived at IBM uh, around 14 years ago now. Uh, these contracts were five, 10 years long. Um, they often covered a whole series of aspects of, uh, of a client's IT infrastructure, maybe take over the entire IT department of a, of a large company. Now they're shorter duration contracts, they're, uh, or they have, becoming, be, have become that over the years, shorter duration, multiple vendors, and renegotiated <coughs> all the time. Uh, so uh, it's a different kind of business than it was 10 years ago, and it's changing again. And now it's changing because of cloud. Uh, the, and so ev everybody's moving to the cloud, or at least they think they would like to move to the cloud. And so part of the work that, that's going on in this, in this part of IBM's business is to help clients uh, transition from an on-premise based delivery of IT services to a cloud based delivery of IT services. And ultimately, the the, uh, the value, one of the values of doing that, I mean, there are lots we could talk about, <coughs> uh, is that um, when you have IT services delivered on the cloud, then the ability to do analytics becomes facilitated um, um, because you're, you've, you've, you have the materials, the data, the infrastructure to do that analytics that, that's on the cloud for integrating across different kinds of data sets and so on. So the, 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 the direction that a lot of companies are going into, including IBM, is to be able to deliver analytic services on the cloud. So the question of how do we move from data to smart decisions? So this is a this is kind of a silly quote that um, <laughs> of Jim Barksdale, uh, who said, you know, if we have data, let's look at the data. If all we have is opinions, then let's go with mine. So the idea being that, you know, if, um, 
uh, companies, they're going to base, they will base their decisions on data if they have it, but if they don't, then it's the, either the loudest voice or the most senior person or whatever who's going to, to uh, call the shots. Of course, it's way more complicated than that, but it, the idea here is that, that um, data somehow is going to um, uh, be the arbiter of differences of opinion. We'll look at data, and data will be able to tell us sort of the, the direction that we should be, the decisions that we should be making. <coughs> but of course, you know, we've always had data. You know, this is, this is a, I love this picture. <laughs> of, uh, of, oh, this is an IBM photo. Uh, uh, back in the day, I don't know the exact date of the photo, I should, but it's probably in the 50s. And, uh, you know, th th we had data back then. And so, but now we're all talking about data, and we're talking about data as, you know, the driver of, of smart decision making. So, um, so what's different? And is there something different here? I mean, data, we've had data. Why all of a sudden are people talking about moving from data to smart decisions? Um, and various people have different ideas about why that might be the case. Um, and I, I should make reference to the fact that, that people are calling this kind of data, data that's from ERP systems, from uh, customer relationship management systems, you know, structured data, are calling this uh, uh, systems of record. In other words, these are the records, the discrete records of an organization. And um, uh, th that's what we've always had. We've always had that, but we have something new now, different now. And that's what's me making us all so excited about moving from data to smart decisions. Uh, can't just be about data. We've had data for a long time. Um, and so people have different ideas. And one of them is uh, Eric Brynjolfsson uh, at MIT. And he believes that data <coughs> plus analytics is resulting in a revolution in measurement. So now what we've got is we've got not just these systems of record data, but we've got what others are calling, I think was coined by Moore, um, we've got systems of engagement, and I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. But the idea here is that because we have uh, so much data and the, and the compute power to, to analyze it uh, and sophisticated uh, algorithms to, you know, to, 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 to do the analysis, that we can now do things we could never do before. We can now see things we could never see before. We've got a new telescope. Um, and so it's going to allow businesses to, as this quote says, understand much more in much more detail what their customers are doing, what their processes are doing, what their employees are doing. So there's something different here. It's not just like it was before when we've always had data. It's, it has to do with the quantities of data and the analytic capabilities to analyze it. So, and where's all that data coming from? This is a slide I'm sure you've seen in other presentations. It's, you know, activity-generated data. It's coming from all of these devices that we wear. I met with students at lunch, and it seems like everyone is, you know, monitoring or doing research around, you know, people being able to monitor their, their behavior or the behavior of others. Uh, and so this is what's generating these um, uh, these vast quantities of data, and it's different kind of data. It's not just systems of record. <coughs> systems of engagement can be video. You know, it can be. Uh, it's in real time. It's streaming, um, it, audio, speech, and so on. So we are now in a different world. The, so that so so we hear, uh, we're in a world of lots of data, a variety of data, different kinds of data, and the compute power and analytics to, to manage it, <coughs> and to understand it, and to draw insights from it. So, and IBM is part of this um, story, uh, would, is and wants to be part of this story. Uh, so this next slide is, uh, again, I, it's not my slide. I, I took it from a presentation uh, about Four, four years ago uh, when IBM was talking about you know, developing analytic solutions. And this was the picture of what it took to develop an analytic solution. So, you know, and all the different kinds of data here, streaming data, text data, video, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it has to be then processed. You have to do data mining. You have to do, you know, fuzzy matching, different kinds of algorithm development. Uh, you have to compose that, you know, using different things, compose it until you finally deliver it on some sort of, <coughs> uh, some sort of technology that delivers that output to, um, manages and delivers that output. So this was the representation that IBM <coughs> Research created for solution, analytic solution 
development. And you know, it, it's it's amazing amount of, of creativity and work that goes into each of these areas. Um, you know, f understanding the streaming data, doing the, the, the cleansing, the fuzzy matching, the, and so on. Uh, but I thought, God, you know, there's something that doesn't feel, there's something missing here in this picture. And I was interested in figuring and thinking more about what was missing in that picture. And um, so I came up with this a picture, and I'm going to explode those <coughs> black boxes in a minute, but it seemed to me that there were things happening on both sides of that picture that weren't being captured there, and that were going to be critically important to go from data to smart decisions. How do you get there? I don't think you can get there with the picture that they were showing. So I thought, well, there's something about data production. How do we actually produce these data? What are the tracking devices? What are the logging devices? What are the um, <coughs> contexts in which we are, which videotape gets created? Um, and, and then on the other end, well, who's going to do what with this? If we're going to go to smart decisions, it's, you can't stop at the output. You're going to have to figure out how do you in integrate and embed that output into organizations so that they can actually get smarter, do better, do different things, if not better things. Um, so I became interested in the these black boxes. Uh, I, I recently read an article that called the, the thing in the middle the black box that we don't understand because so few people are able to do at least the kind of research I do on the work inside that, that the, the, the figure that I showed, which I think is true too. So one could black box that too, although in this case it was the, it was the part that was uh, given, given visibility and these other parts were, were left, uh, left unspoken, I think. Um, and actually, I talked to people about this at IBM at the time, and, and there was a lot of, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, uh-huh, and, and agreement at some level, but not, not really the uh, commitment, I guess, to really let's, let's take, or, or maybe, in my sense, I believe, not really an appreciation for the consequences of, of, uh, of not taking a look at, at what's inside those, those black boxes. So the black box of, of, of production, you know, things like, you know, what social factors and behaviors shape the data quality. I'll have a little bit to say about that in one of my examples. Um, how's the environment in instrumented? Who's actually getting tracked? Who isn't? Does that make a difference? Uh, uh, you know, and, and I'm also going to do an example of workflow. You know, what, what aspects of the workflow get captured? What ones get left behind? What kinds of smart, how smart do we get when we don't think about these other things? Just because we happen to be able to, to collect data on some of them. Um, so that was, that was some of the issues I thought were important to explore in the black box of, of uh, data production. <coughs> and then the black box of data <coughs> consumption, you know, somehow these, these analytics have got to find a purchase inside the organization. Um, but, you know, who defines the business problems for which these analytics are going to be useful? Um, what kind of resources do the people who are going to make sense of these analytics have to understand them? <coughs> And it's more than just, do we have good visualizations? Yes, that's important. But even good visualizations are dependent upon the organizational context in which we measure them or evaluate them as good or not. Uh, so for some people, a good, good visualization may not look the same as for others and for other kinds of, of uh, occupations and, and skill sets. Um, you know, can the data be trusted? How do we get, provide that kind of trust level that's important for uh, being willing to take these analytics that may be perfectly uh, well executed, uh, you know, no, they get you an A++ in your you know, advanced you know, data science class at any university, but do they in fact provide the ability of people to, inside the organization, to trust them such that they're going to make decisions based on, on that output? So what I want to do now then, given that that's sort of the territory that I was interested in exploring, I want to look at three case studies, if you will. One, and, and one of them I'm going to focus on the question of whose effort, uh, the second one on whose agency, and the, the last one on whose expertise. Um, and I should say that the way that I, so I kind of, I, uh, I don't know, what's the right word? I embedded myself in these projects. I latched onto, I became a part of, a, a member of the projects. These are all project, research projects inside of the I, IBM Almaden Research Center. And I became a member of these projects, uh, performing certain you know, <coughs> tasks myself, 
I'm not a data scientist or a mathematician or a computer scientist or a software engineer, but um, you know, there was I was useful, uh, but I also <laughs> used it as the opportunity to see firsthand, you know, how um, what some of the issues were, you know, and what 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 it meant to actually, you know, move again from data to smart decisions. So uh, first one is whose effort? Okay, um, so. Let's see, how am I doing on time? Okay, good. So this is um, a project that we did not, research did not develop the workflow tool, but a workflow tool was being introduced into the work of uh, people who, again, in this IT outsourcing context, uh, who um, responded to what are called requests for service. So. Um, if you're a big company and IBM is handling your IT department for you, aspects of it, and you would like some additional service, you know, you're, you've already got a relationship with IBM, but you need a little more of this or you need that to be a little different, then you put in a request for service proposal and it goes to <coughs> this group of people who then do, processes that request for service and, tell, and on the other side of that processing, is a contract that the client can sign and say, yes, let's move forward with the work. So there, the, the issue was that um, there were some inefficiencies in this, in this sort of ad hoc process. I mean, there was a formal description of it, but sort of everybody, each of these uh, IT outsourcing um, deals were kind of handling it a little bit differently. They wanted to create some more rationality in how the system worked. They wanted to be able to track it so that um, well, one of the reasons, I've got to be careful here, you guys are video no. <laughs> <laughs> So they, uh, they, the belief that I'll show on the slide in a minute of some of the benefits of this, but the, the idea was that, you know, we, we can get better at this, and if we can know when a, a, a request for proposal moves from one stage to the next, we can timestamp it, we can say, yes, this has happened, then we can say, uh-oh, this one's been delayed. And we need to now go in and make sure that we can move it along faster because it looks like it's stalled in that, that step of the process. And so they wanted a way to monitor this. And then ultimately they also wanted the ability, now you have all this data on all these RFSs across the organization and you now have um, the ability to look across the organization. Oh, this group is doing it better than that one. Or this one, we see patterns here. We can do analysis on all this data that's being generated because people are using this workflow tool. Um, and that's going to help us, not only the individual uh, managers of the request for service process, but the organization as a whole is going to get better and smarter at what we do. Um, and, and this slide is just, again, this is not my slide. This was a slide from a deck that was talking about um, the benefits of this workflow tool. It had a name, I, I took the name out. Um, and so the benefits are overall. The client gets benefits, the SO business gets benefits, um, both overall and by individual account, uh, and then the CIO's office, who are the folks who actually develop, develop this, this uh, workflow <coughs> tool. And as you can see that a lot of the, the benefits um, you know, come from the ability to uh, manage decisions uh, based on metrics, um, you know, across the account. So let's see if I can read some of these. Uh, you know, automate the collection of reporting, uh, provide enhanced reporting, um, enable management decisions based on metrics, and, and so on and so forth. So the idea was that we're going to be able to do these, be able to manage our business better. We're going to get smarter at how we manage our business. So one of the first things that, so we got called in actually because they were having difficulties getting people to adopt the tool and use it as intended. And um, so um, that's how I kind of first became involved in it. And uh, what I did is at that point is I, I did a study of the work of these requests for manage, RFS managers. Mm -hmm. Um, to understand what they actually did and why it was that they might not be so keen on using this workflow tool. Um, and what I, I'll say a little bit more about what, what we ended up doing, but, but important here is that one of the big problems was that there was this gap between the effort 
of using the workflow tool, and it, and it rested with the RFS managers and the value they got of the existing tool. They got almost no benefit from it, zero. They already knew, they already had their way of tracking these things. They knew way more than the workflow tool knew about the interactions they were having with the client um, to move this RFS along. It wasn't something they could do all by themselves. It had to be done in interaction with, with the client. And so because they were getting no benefit, they were being, they had to be almost forced to use the tool. <laughs> Um, and, and if they did use it, it was always out of date. You know, okay, God, at the end of the week, I'm going to have to go in and make the workflow tool be up to date. So it was never, it wasn't real time like it was supposed to be. It was something you did as an added effort. At some point, they actually hired a bunch of folks <laughs> to uh, to actually input the data because the RFS managers didn't want to do it. Um, and um, uh, so, so anyway, so they they were. Um, reluctant to use the tool, and the, one of the ways they got them to do it is they started doing the reporting part of this. So what are we going to do? We're going to report on how everyone's doing. And so these reports would come out, and they would all look like red, red, red. So the whole yellow, green, yellow, red kind of way of assessing activities inside many places, maybe even here, uh, was, is and was alive and well in, at IBM at the time. And, and so they, they would get these reports and they would be all red. And <laughs> that was, a, you know, oh my God. And they would get these emails saying, you know, you've got to get this up to date. <coughs> and, you know, light, not th serious <coughs> threats, but sort of threats. And so what we did is, well, anyway, we did this study and we realized that maybe there were some things that could be done to make the output from this tool, the data, actually useful to the RFS managers. Um, so we created our own reporting <laughs> uh, and our own way of visualizing the, 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 the results that, and one that they could use in their interactions with the client. They could, so they were already producing these Excel spreadsheets or, or PowerPoints <coughs> that they were using. So now they could use our dashboard, as we call it, um, uh, to not only to visualize and understand uh, the, the, the status of their RFSs, they could use it with the client. They could annotate it. They could take the same kind of notes they were taking when they uh, were uh, interacting with clients using their spreadsheets. Uh, and, and so we kind of, we fit the workflow tool into the work practices that existed among these folks and provided them with uh, you know, with a, a motivation for using the tool, because now if they use the tool, they actually got benefit from it. It produced these outputs that they could use in their day-to-day -day work. It took a step out of the things they were already doing and, and <coughs> made the use of the tool more useful. And so this, this uh, tool is now, continues to be used several years later, um, and it, it, you know, we talk about it as sort of a virtuous cycle that we created where um, you, you create where the people who have to put the effort in to do the work are getting the benefit. And in the end, the other guys who got the benefit were the senior managers who wanted to have a look across the organization at how the business was doing. And now they had at least more accurate information upon which to base their, their thinking. So what's the lesson here? The lesson is <clears throat> that we got to think about who's producing these data that we're going to be using for our analysis. What's the effort and what's the benefit they get? I think about this, <clears throat> or even even effort maybe be too narrow a word. Maybe we need to be talking about what's the cost, um, uh, or and the cost could be more than just in your labor uh, for those who are asked to uh, either use or engage with these um, with these technologies, with the data producing technologies, um, and you know thinking about uh, talking to some some of you earlier today about um, you know. So, uh, elder care and uh, kind of uh, technologies and the idea of, you know, tracking old, old elders, older people um, for the benefit of their, their children or the benefit of the caregivers or whatever, but I think we need to be thinking about tracking, if we're going to track them, for the, their benefit, right? It's, it's because then they get in, in, enrolled and engaged in a different kind of way. So I guess the lesson from this study is just we need to really be paying attention to you know how data get generated that we're going to base our analytics on, um, and and there are ways to think about it so that you can um, try and understand the production aspects of the data, uh, and and help to un understand the quality 
and, and the status of that data that you're using for, for the analysis. Okay, so the second example is one that's going to be focused more on the question of whose agency. <clears throat> so this was a project with um, a group that, <clears throat> not the request for service folks, but these are the people, <coughs> excuse me, who, um, who are, they're also involved in the request for service, um, and they, um, the project that we did was to try and understand if we could predict what the demand would be for the, the, their services. So that this is a dedicated group, a centralized group, unlike the, the folk that I talked about before who were associated with individual accounts. This was a, a, a centralized group who provided services to other, other parts of IBM. And, um, so they would get requests that would come into them to say, we need this solution. We need you to develop a solution for this, um, this request. Uh, so they actually were a kind of a component of the, uh, that workflow part. Some of that workflow went off and to the solutioners who developed the solution. These are the guys who did that solutioning work. And um, we were interested in seeing if we could uh, predict the demand for, uh, for, for, um, for, their, for their labor. We had, so we had the data, they gave us the data from you know, all the past work that they'd done. They had a, their own database that they kept. Uh, and we uh, did analysis on the data uh, to predict the number of FTEs that would be required for solutioning in the future. So this is predictive analytics. We look at the past, we try to predict the future. And um, you know, we had a great relationship with this group. Um, and lots of iterations before we got to the point where what I'm sharing with you now. Uh, and this was slide eight in a deck. We would have these, you know, meetings once a week with this group. <coughs> and in this one, uh, the, the uh, data scientist who happened to be a PhD in operations research from Stanford, um, who had been, done most of the analytic work here, he was presenting this slide which showed that, um, that there was going to be a decrease in demand for their labor in the coming eight weeks. And so, you know, this went, we had a conversation about it in the meeting, and people, you know, well, it didn't really arise as a big issue. Um, they were just sort of taking in what we'd done, the, you know, the, the, the kind of the analytics, the data that we were using. But then shortly thereafter, we get an email from one of the members of the group, not the manager, but one of the members, and he said, he's, I believe there's a huge concern that we need to adjust prior to the meeting with Mary and Michael. These were, we were going to have a meeting the next week with these directors who were going to bless this project uh, going forward. And um, I, I guess maybe a little context here. So both of these projects that I've been talking about, this is the research team collaborating with parts of IBM's business, right? So <laughs> it's, we're, we're working, research is, is doing research in relationship to another part of IBM's business. And so there was going to be this meeting, and they said, we, we, something's wrong here. Um, it's showing that you know, we're going to need a decrease in, in FTEs by 22. And that can't possibly be right. We know our business. We know the work that we do, and that can't possibly be correct. And so we need to go back to the drawing board and figure out what's going on here. At this point, everybody, everybody believes in anal the analytics to tell us what the right decision is. I mean, the people we're working with, they believed it. Our data scientists, they believed it. You know, there's a lot of commitment to this, right? But something doesn't add up. There's something wrong here. And so, because they know that they don't need 22 fewer workers uh, in the coming eight weeks. And so, um, so we get this email, and then, then shortly thereafter, we get an email from the ma his manager, the manager of this group, who uh, his short one just says, urgent demand and forecast needs to be adjusted. This is major. We can't go forward. You know, hold the horses. You know, um, and we barely have staff. We, we barely staff the deals today. It's important to get this accurate. So. Then she goes off and meets with her group, and this is the next email where they've gone and seriously thought, okay, what could possibly be wrong here? So they come up with all the reasons that they think that uh, the analytics has to be producing inaccurate results. And they list the four here, and these need to be addressed before we can move forward. So we get this email, 
and then our the data scientist, this you know incredibly lovely guy, um, very committed to the work he does, very sincere, genuine, um, you know, wanting to do the right thing in every instance. And so he goes back and he rechecks and checks and does this other checking and so on to, to make sure that you know he hasn't over what does he overlook? What is you know? Do you miss something here? And and then he responds saying, regarding your four points, the current forecasting model captures all of these aspects. So everything that you were concerned about, we already do. So that can't be the problem. You know, it's not those four things. And then he, he speculates that the problem has to do with the fact that the world of the past is not necessarily the world of the future. <laughs> Duh. Um, and that that there we had we because we made some assumptions about the movement of these RFSs they move from they move through these <coughs> phases different phases but through these phases of solutioning um, and at some point they can be abandoned or they can be canceled or they can be concluded and so there's a there, he has measured what happened how long does it take these different levels of different complexity of solution to move through each of those phases and so the surmise is that the data have a, you know, are showing a different kind of um, pattern than the pattern that's currently in, in place. And that's the only, so the analytics are perfect, uh, you know, but they're, they, they, um, they're, you know, they, there's an error not in the analytics, but in the assumptions we made about the relationship between the historical analytics and the future. And so the next thing we get is, executive review meeting, Can't, I didn't put that slide up, but essentially the meeting was canceled and we actually did not move forward with this part of the project <clears throat> because, well, who knows all the reasons, but there, the risks, I, I, the, le, the, the lesson here, I guess, is that there are real organizational consequences to these analytics and that there's knowledge that people need to have to figure out to make sense of the analytics but also to know the impact that it has inside of organizations <coughs> and these guys were not wanting this to go forward um, there was still talk on our side that hey the they just don't want to know the truth you know I mean it's sort of essentially it's not good news and so you, you don't want bad news and so let's you know we, we don't want to go forward um, with with analytics that's going to produce bad news and produce uh, you know uh, you know, potentially have an impact on our group with people being reassigned or whatever. Um, so that's that. So that's one of the lessons here uh, is that you know we have to understand the context into which these analytics are going to uh, try and you know shape future decision making, and that there are very serious vested interests in you know in um, in what they say, and that people will do what they need to in order to protect. Their, their positions inside the organizations to the degree they can. Um, so and I, just to quickly hear, th there was a second part to this project with the same group, which I think is also kind of instructive uh, for, for, the, for what I'm trying to talk about today. And that's, we did another uh, project, the same group, um, to um, optimize resources. So there's a group of, this is the group that they have n number of pe people work in this group. They farm themselves out to do these solutioning projects. And they kind of work on a first come, first serve basis. So a request comes in, they look around, who do we have available? They assign somebody to take on that work, sometimes based on their expertise or the particular kind of solution it is, but it's <coughs> also based on who's available. Um, and uh, and then if they don't do it on a first time first come basis or some degree by expertise, they sometimes get uh, <coughs> the people who uh, the industry managers. These are high level people in IBM who manage, say, if it's financial services, they manage all of the IT outsourcing uh, jobs, co contracts, relationships with. Uh, companies that are in the financial services industry and there's another one for retail and so on so these are senior people and they might come and say oh you know group uh, this client is really upset we need to we need to move this forward right away I need a solution quickly and so then they would bump it up right they would they would say okay we're gonna do this one before we do the next one but the, the analysis that this um, data scientist did was uh, 
found that if they were able to prioritize the work, so he was able to do analysis of, of all the, these uh, requests that come into this group, um, how many of them actually get sold? So how many of them actually end up in a contract? And there's a difference between you know, the different uh, clients. Some clients, they're putting these in all the time. And they may bite on, you know, they get a solution and they may or may not bite on it. Um, and, so they, and so the analysis could tell, you know, this client is likely to go from request all the way to buying something from IBM. So if we were to prioritize those clients, he could calculate what, what we would save. Um, both what we would save, what, how much more money we would make, because we'd get these ones that actually were going to turn out to be uh, real deals processed sooner, but we could also uh, uh, have some additional resources available for, for other things. So, <clears throat> so this was, you know, this was like a win-win-win kind of uh, analysis. And yet what happened was the group that we were doing it for, the same group that I was talking about before, they are in no position <coughs> to prioritize their work. They are powerless to do that. The prioritization of the work is by these industry leaders, and they are all in their own domains. They're not going to, they're not even thinking IBM globally. <laughs> they're thinking about them. And so they're the ones who could prioritize, but these guys couldn't prioritize. They couldn't say, I'm going to take this job instead of that one. Um, and that, that would, you know, that would uh, be outside of their authority, level of authority. And so even though the analytics was, you know, <coughs> In this case, at any rate, wasn't being questioned. They were not in a position to, to actually uh, take advantage of it. And really, nowhere in the organization could they. Maybe all the way up <clears throat> to the, you know, uh, maybe the head of the global technology services group could have made that decision. But he would have had to gone very high in order to get the kind of cooperation <laughs> across these different silos that would have said, yes, OK, let's prioritize based on the analysis that shows this client is more likely to actually by than, than another. I see I'm very low on time. Um, I think I won't. I won't do this, this whose expertise example, but maybe we can talk about it over uh, coffee, whatever. Um, it, uh, maybe I can jump to the punchline without, um, I can say that this is an area where we're developing analytics to help sellers uh, sell cloud uh, infrastructure services. And the, the moral of this story is we have two different analytics. One based, one's for risk of defection to be able to say which of these accounts, these clients, are likely to defect to say no more, don't want to do business with IBM anymore. And uh, that's one. And the other one is um, a uh, growth and shrinkage predictions which shows which of these clients uh, is likely to grow or shrink their we can call it wallet share with IBM by X percent. The first one is a very simple um, <coughs> algorithm based again on two years of ledger data. We've got historical data. We're predicting the future. Um, and it's very simple. Anybody can kind of do the math, understand it. It's a quotient up there. It's used, to, it's modeled, you know, against the historical data and it predicts about 50 percent accurate. In other words, of the ones that this analytics <coughs> identifies as likely to defect, half of them will. It can, it can be proved, you know, do the, you know, you have the test and then the, <laughs> they, you know, develop the algorithm and you test it on, the, on, on future data. And so, and so, you know, and that's not too bad, but it's not really great either. The other one, the growth and shrinkage, uses a gradient boosting method and some additional kind of, um, um, uh, handcrafted, you know, analytics to make this really, really good. They, they get between, uh, this analytics produces between 80 and 90 percent <coughs> accuracy. But darned if anybody can understand exactly what's happening. It's got all these, <laughs> all these features, features that you don't even know, you know, log of the backward ratio and so on <laughs> that, you know, that are being used to be able to make these very accurate predictions about growth and shrinkage. So you think, well, this is fantastic. The, but the problem is it's very difficult to reason about what's going on here. And in fact, we have, we're still, in the, this project's still ongoing, and we're in the process now of sort of hiding information 
because if we fear that if the sellers see it, they will get confused. They'll say, oh my God, but this, this algorithm is predicting you know, growth by this amount, and I look at what I as a human can understand, and I can't draw the connection. I can't see why that would be the case. And, and so because it's very difficult to reason about the output, even though it's, quote, accurate. Um, so, you know, and so this is an ongoing project. I don't have the final story here, but one of the issues is how do we, how the hope is that over time they're going to realize that these predictions are really accurate and they're going to then start trusting them without being able to understand them. They're going to be able to say, well, it said that and God, they were right last time. I'm, I'm guessing they're going to be right again because there's no way for them to independently understand the output in such a way that they can feel comfortable with it. It's, you know, it, it is that this, the other kind of black box <laughs> that, uh, that uh, some folks are talking about. Um, so, I think I'll stop there, and I know I haven't even left time for questions, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We do have a little time. We'll, okay. we'll take a little time before we go downstairs. Uh, so it, it kind of sounds like maybe you don't have the, the full answer to this, but um, you know, as you are introducing these new methods for analytics, how do you help people to cope with that loss of agency? Mm -hmm. Or is there a way to increase their individual agency to accept these new methods? Yeah, I mean, the thing that's really been interesting is that people are very, initially, very welcoming of analytics. Every, I mean, everybody's bought the, drank the Kool-Aid or whatever, bought the, the belief that analytics is actually going to be good for us, going to help us. And I, I bought it to some degree myself. So, I mean, you know, I'm, uh, so the, we have an, an receptive audience for this, right, initially. Then they actually get the analytics, right? And then they have to start figuring out how to, what to do about it. How does it fit into all of the other things that are, you know, that are, that are so critical to their individual success and what they believe the success of their group or the organization is. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure that it's people are feeling threatened or <laughs> they, they would love to be able to, in, in, at least, and again, you know, in principle, they would love to be able to, um, to take advantage of these analytics. Uh, but when they actually engage, encounter them, then that raises all these other issues about, you know, how uh, can they do that in a way that makes sense to them, a way that preserves their own place in the organization. I mean, there's a little, there is a little bit of, you know, issues. I, I think it's, I think we over, actually overemphasize the place of, you know, oh, I might lose my job. I mean, that's <coughs> very important to everybody in the society as well as the individuals. But I think people are not, that's not the first thing that I think people are <coughs> concerned with when they actually, again, confront these analytics in their workplace. It's how do I figure out how to make use of them in a way that makes sense. Um, and part of that makes sense is preserving my job, but I think that's not the main, that's not the only, the only, the only part of that story. Um, but no, I think, you know, <coughs> because actually I, I, when, you, when you do start encountering these analytics, you realize in some ways it surfaces all the expertise that they had, that they didn't really know how important it was, you know, like the sales guys, they, you know, the, they know so much about these accounts, you know, um, and they're, they're happy to get pointed to, oh, that one, you know, because they have so many, they can't actually keep track of them themselves, but then they, they can, oh, that one, that's right, that's the contract that had these, you know, these, these uh, services that were, were, were predicted to end at a certain time, or, oh, that's the one where the, we see this cyclical pattern of usage, you know, so all the kind of organizational expertise they have to make sense of the output is so important. So in some ways, it, it actually exposes <laughs> some of their expertise that may have, you know, been uh, not not recognized. Yeah. Thanks. This is really interesting. Um, one of the things I, I noticed, or in, in sort of in the space that you're talking about, <clears throat> is that the analytics seem to be deployed very much in kind of a as a top-down management tool. You manage down with the analytics. 
And I'm wondering is, you know, are there places where people have actually been able to, say, look upwards in the organization with analytics or to use them in maybe more, um, slightly more revolutionary or, or, yeah. or other kinds of ways to challenge some of those power structures or change those dynamics within the organization? Yeah, I, I don't know if I have an answer. Um, um, I mean, our, our the, this last project, the sales analytics, you know, our target, our first target, you know, user was, uh, were the sellers themselves. Um, but of course, management quickly saw this also as providing them with a way of looking at, you know, which accounts are, you know, doing well and which aren't. And, you know, and then you can associate groups or people with that and, and so on. So, you know, getting a view, top-down view is, is useful to them, but, but our, our uh, initial user was the seller to help them figure out what did they need to do in order to make this account not defect or, um, or, or you know, not shrink or, and so on. But, um, you know, and in the case of the workflow tool, you know, we were concerned that the people who, you know, had to use the tool were getting some benefit from it. Uh, even though I agree with you that the in initial initiative was what much more driven by a desire to get sort of a handle on <coughs> the business and figure out how executives could do things differently in order to improve the, that part of IBM's business. But I think, it's, I think we should be thinking about that myself, that you know, as, we, as we develop these analytics, thinking about you know, how is it that we can empower the people who were we're, you know, we're measuring and we're tracking and so on, and not just the people who, um, you know, have some reason to want to manage them. So we, we do have more time for questions, but I think we're going to do that downstairs. So, so as, as usual, we'll have our, uh, our reception downstairs in the, in the um, fifth floor lobby. Um, Jeanette will be there, be able to, um, to, to answer more questions and discuss things. But um, join me once again, and thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.